So we're going to assume that we have a cell. It's gone through the G1 phase. It got the green light from neighboring cells to, to enter into the S phase, which was a very long time consuming phase where we copied all the DNA inside the cell. It quickly progressed through the G2 phase where we manufacture those key proteins needed for cellular division to occur. And now we're going to embark on the M phase, which has two parts to it, mitosis and cytokinesis. Now, um, mitosis is a series of events that occur in eukaryotes in order to equally uh, and faithfully divide up the DNA into the two daughter cells so that each gets a full complement of DNA. Now I want to stop here for just a second and point out to you that prokaryotes do not undergo mitosis. Uh, prokaryotes don't have a nucleus and so they don't have to deal with some of the same headaches that a eukaryote does when it comes to dividing up the material inside the nucleus. And because they don't have a true nucleus uh, and they only have one chromosome that's circular, the process of cellular division for a prokaryote is much easier. The process is called binary fission, which means to literally to split into two parts. And all that happens is if this is my bacterial cell or prokaryotic cell, we make a copy of the DNA as you can see here and then we just simply shuttle one piece of DNA off to one side of the cell, the other uh, circular piece of DNA to the other side of the cell, pinch down the middle and divide it into two separate cells. Very simple process binary fission. Um, in eukaryotes the series of events is more complex because the DNA is housed inside of a nucleus. So we've got to get into that nucleus and start dividing out multiple chromosomes. There's not just one chromosome like in prokaryotes, there's multiple chromosomes. We've got to make sure each daughter cell get, gets exactly uh, an exact complete copy of the DNA. So the events of mitosis are really the events that outline what we call nuclear division meaning the, divi the dividing up of the contents of the nucleus. And they are always followed in eukaryotes by a series of events called cytokinesis, which is basically cytoplasmic division. This is where we divide up all the other goodies in the cell. Each cell gets so many organelles, each cell gets so much cytosol, each cell gets so many ribosomes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in uh, eukaryotes, I said that the process of mitosis is a complex one because we have multiple chromosomes. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page as to what exactly a chromosome is. If we look at the DNA inside the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell, such as you see here, we, we would discover that the DNA uh, is a very highly uh, compacted um, source of, of uh, material. So we take the DNA helix and instead of just having a bunch of DNA helices floating around inside the nucleus, there would never be enough room inside the nucleus for all the DNA if we didn't do some sort of um, packing of the DNA to compact it into a small space. So we do that by wrapping the DNA around proteins called histone proteins. And we wrap the DNA around eight histone proteins. Uh, we wrap it around twice and that creates something called a nucleosome. And so we get all the, these long strings of nucleosomes all along here. Um, they almost look like uh, pearls on, a, on a, a necklace strand. Then we coil all those nucleosomes together so that they're even more tightly packed. Then we coil all that nucle uh, coiled nucleosomes so we get what's called a looped chromatin. Okay, looped chromatin. And um, if we condense that chromatin up even further, if we really pack it tightly, we can create something that's actually visible to us as humans under the microscope called a chromosome. Chromosomes are only visible during mitosis. During other, any other time in a cell, if you were to look at the DNA, it would be in the chromatin state here, which means it would not be coiled sufficiently for you to be able to see it visibly. Instead, you just have what looks like a diffuse region in the nucleus um, that, that contains uh, chromosomal material, but it doesn't have a distinct structure to it that you can see. Now, there are two different types of chromatin. There's heterochromatin and there's euchromatin. 
and uh, the difference between the two of those has to do with which one is uh, being actively transcribed and which one is not being actively transcribed. The active chromatin is the euchromatin. The inactive chromatin, in other words, the chromatin that is not being actively transcribed to make messenger RNA, uh, we call that heterochromatin. And when you look at heterochromatin under the microscope, if you were able to see the nucleus up close, it tends to be uh, appear darker in color, whereas the euchromatin appears lighter in color. So we've got these um, duplicated chromosomes inside of a cell. The way we know that a chromosome is duplicated is it has this characteristic uh, X-like appearance to it. When a chromosome is in a cell and it is unduplicated, such as when a cell is in its G1 phase and has not yet gone through synthesis to copy the DNA, the chromosomes all are a single strand. They all have a little region of protein somewhere near their center or near one end or near the other end. And that, that little um, region of protein is called the centromere. When I duplicate chromosomes, I make a complete copy of the chromosome and that complete copy attaches to the first copy at the centromere. And that's what lends this kind of X-shape appearance to a chromosome is when it has a complete copy of itself attached to it at the centromere. When I have a duplicated chromosome, such as what I've just drawn here with the black and the red strand, those two individual strands of DNA that are joined together at the centromere are called sister chromatids. When I have an unduplicated chromosome, such as this one down here, which does not have a copy attached to it, when I have an unduplicated chromosome like this one, there are no sister chromatids present. Okay? If I'm all alone, I can't be a sister. I can only be a sister if I'm with somebody else. Okay? So when I have duplicated chromosomes, I can have sister chromatids. When I do not have a duplicated chromosome, I cannot have sister chromatids. The, pur the purpose of mitosis is to carefully orchestrate the dividing up of the sister chromatids in all these duplicated chromosomes so that each daughter cell gets exactly uh, uh, one complete copy of all the chromosomal material. Uh, the way to know how many chromosomes are present in any cell, by the way, and this is going to be a critical piece of information to know as we go forward on the coming slides, count the number of centromeres. So if I were to count up how many chromosomes I've drawn just in my discussion here, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven chromosomes present because I see seven centromeres. Of those seven chromosomes, one of them is unduplicated and has no sister chromatids, and one, two, three, four, five, six of them are duplicated chromosomes, and they do contain sister chromatids. Now, uh, another couple key features that I need for you to be familiar with before we launch into how we divide up the chromosomes between the two daughter cells in, in mitosis. Uh, you'll hear me use the term kinetochore. Kinetochores are little regions of proteins located on either side of the centromere. The purpose of those kinetochores is to serve as anchoring points for something called a mitotic spindle. And we'll talk more about mitotic spin spindles later, but just remember for now, kinetochores are little protein anchors that attach to the mitotic spindles. We've already talked about centromeres, and again, I want to remind you that centromeres are not always in the center of a chromosome. Sometimes they can be at one end, sometimes they can be at the other. Um, when an organism has a complete set of chromosomes, and it received one complete set of chromosomes from mom and one complete set of chromosomes from dad, that means it has two complete sets of chromosomes, or what we say is 2N. An organism that is 2N, which by the way you are, because you got one complete set of chromosomes from your mom's egg and one complete set of chromosomes from your dad's sperm, those are called diploid organisms. When, an or when a cell has only one complete set of DNA, 
it's called a haploid organism and the only kind of, ha of cells in our bodies that are haploid are egg cells and sperm cells. We're going to talk more about haploid and diploid next week when we get to the topic of meiosis, but I mention it now just to kind of get those terms in your head. Now let's go ahead and look at the stages of mitosis here. Let's see what happens when a eukaryotic cell divides up its genetic material between two daughter cells. There's a series of basically five different phases that occur here, starting with prophase, then prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. We're going to go through each of these one by one. Prophase is the very first event of uh, mitosis and a whole lot of things happen in prophase. Now remember in a eukaryotic cell we have this thing called a nucleus and it has a nuclear membrane that surrounds all of the DNA. If I want to get into that um, region where the DNA is located so I can divide up the DNA, the chromosomes, between two daughter cells, I have to do something to get rid of the nuclear envelope or the nuclear membrane so that I can get at the DNA. So one of the first things that happens during prophase is you will see that the nuclear envelope disappears and you will no longer be able to see a discrete uh, 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 boundary between the nucleus of the cell and the cytoplasm of the cell. You will also see that all that chromatin that we talked about previously, the d kind of the um, only pseudo-condensed DNA, becomes extremely highly condensed and forms chromosomes that are finally visible to you under the microscope as discrete objects, these X-like structures you see here. Another thing that happens during prophase is the nucleolus also disappears. Remember that the nucleolus is a region of the nucleus where RNA manufacture occurs. That nucleolus region uh, is no longer visible during mitosis. It's not that it disappears like goes away forever, it just becomes uh, not visible for a period of time. Another thing that occurs is some structures called centrioles begin to move apart. In all cells, all cells have a structure called a centriole, and the centriole is a location where microtubules are manufactured. During the G2 phase, remember the G2 phase was when we manufactured key proteins needed for mitosis only. During the G2 phase, the centriole in the cell was copied, so now there are two centrioles present, and these two centrioles begin to move away from each other in opposite directions during prophase. Okay, that's all prophase. A lot happens in prophase, but these are all events getting us ready to start dividing up the nuclear content of the cell. In prometaphase, you'll see now that those centromeres, or centrioles, I'm sorry, the centrioles that I said had begun to move apart have now moved to opposite sides of the cell from they're at like the north and south pole of the cell, if you will. And those centrioles begin to grow spindle fibers. These are microtubules that begin to extend out from the centrioles. When the centrioles uh, grow those spindles out and those my, uh, microtubule spindles connect with the kinetochores, we now are in prometaphase. So when the spindles attach to the kinetochores on the chromosomes, we now are in prometaphase. Now, next thing that's going to happen, we're going to start having a tug of war going on here between the, the mitotic spindle fibers from this centriole and the mitotic fibers from this centriole. And they're going to do a push and pull routine on each chromosome until such time as all the chromosomes are literally lined up along the equator of the cell. We sometimes call this equator the metaphase plate. When all of the chromosomes, the duplicated chromosomes, are lined up along the middle of the cell, we are in metaphase. Think metaphase M equals middle. And you can even see that in this picture up here of an animal cell, how all of the uh, chromosomes have lined up neatly along the middle of the cell. Here's the same example in a plant cell. During anaphase, now that we've lined everybody up along the equator, we can now uh, 
uh, very easily divide up our content in two. And what's going to happen is, remember, we have these duplicated chromosomes, and each duplicated chromosome is attached to one centro centriole on one side and another centriole on the other side of the cell. Each of these um, centrioles are going to begin pulling on their spindle fibers. And what that's going to do is it's going to literally pull apart this chromosome, this duplicated chromosome. It's going to pull the sister chromatids apart and those sister chromatids are going to start moving towards their respective poles. So during anaphase, we are pulling apart the sister chromatids. You can think of A in anaphase means apart. And indeed, you can see that's what's happening right here. Now, something interesting to note, on the previous slide here, and let me erase this out of the way, on this previous slide, in this imaginary cell here, we have a total of one, two, three, four duplicated chromosomes present. I know there are a total of four chromosomes because I see four centromeres. Because they are duplicated chromosomes, that means I have eight sister chromatids. When we move into anaphase and we pull apart those duplicated chromosomes, I go from having four duplicated chromosomes present in the cell to having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight unduplicated chromosomes present. I know there are eight because if I look carefully, I can see that there are eight centromeres present. One centromere per chromosome. It's just that now the chromosomes are unduplicated as opposed to duplicated. And indeed, you can see up in this picture of an animal cell in anaphase, uh, it's very clear when those, um, uh, when those sister chromatids begin to pull apart in the cell. The last event that happens in mitosis is telophase, and I think of T for telophase meaning the end. And in this part, uh, you'll be happy to know if you know clearly everything that happens in prophase, everything that happened in prophase, the reverse of it happens in telophase, and that gets us back to a, a cell that has completed mitosis. So in prophase, the nuclear envelope disappeared. Now in telophase, the nuclear envelope reappears. In prophase, the nucleolus disappeared. In telophase, it reappears. In prophase, spindle fibers started to form out of the centrioles. In uh, telophase, all of those spindle fibers go away. Okay. In prophase, the uh, chromatin condensed to become visible chromosomes. In telophase, they begin to uncondense and go back to chromatin. So everything that happened in prophase, if you can remember all those events, just do the opposite of that and you're explaining what happens in telophase. At the conclusion of telophase, you will notice we still have only one cell. It's a cell that has two nuclei, but it's still one cell because the purpose of mitosis, remember, was nuclear division. The splitting up of the material inside the nucleus. We still have yet to split up all the other material in the cell, which includes the cytosol, the cytoplasm with all of the ribosomes and organelles. We still got to divide those up. The process by which we divide up all of the rest of the parts of the cell is the second phase of the M phase, and it's called cytokinesis. This is where we get cytoplasmic division. Now, in animal cells, this occurs when a bunch of uh, fibrous proteins form a ring around right where the metaphase plate was and they begin to contract or pinch inward and this creates something called a cleavage furrow. Um, the the uh, proteins are called a contractile ring. They form a ring around the middle and by pinching they 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 create this cleavage furrow and eventually uh, they will pinch apart the two cells so that they become completely independent or separate from one another. Plant cells are a little different. They have a bit of a challenge because they have a rigid cell wall. So what they have to do is if I have a um, plant cell here and the black represents a cell wall and the red represents a cell membrane and inside here's one nucleus and here's the other and we just finished mitosis. Because we can't just pinch the cells apart, that rigid cell wall prevents it. What we have to do instead is literally build a fresh 
cell wall between the two cells and that fresh cell wall is called a cell plate. Okay, enough on that. I think I've given you plenty to think about. Let's talk a little bit in the next part of this about the cell cycle, control points of the cell cycle and how those interplay with cancer.